Uh, we're going to talk uh, on X27 tonight, and it's probably one of the most descriptive, uh, detailed writings um, in the New Testament um, by Luke. And um, I actually, I'm often um, flabbergasted at the detail and why God wanted that much detail, but um, I also love the fact that um, when there is so much detail and it's so uh, precise, um, it's almost as if it's also um, validating the accuracy, the truth um, of the Bible and what it's about. It's not any some kind of vague book. So uh, we can also look, zoom out a little bit tonight, I think, and also just look at how wonderful God um, inspired this book to be written. Uh, that um, could be um, validated years and years later and, 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 and uh, could be seen uh, and, um, and actually at any stage be challenged and found uh, truthful. So, so this is an incredible um, sort of chapter of, of detailed writing. And um, there is a book, uh, I also wanted to just say this, there's a book uh, called Paul's Final Sea Voyage by uh, James Smith. Um, and he's a actually 30 years experienced uh, seaman um, who actually spent, he, he lived around eight, in the 1800s. He spent uh, a couple of years at uh, Malta, on the island of Malta, um, actually um, um, investigating this particular chapter. Uh, and all the details are written on there from the winds and the ports and everything of, and the whole sea uh, experience and the sailing experience. And apparently in that particular book, he um, says that there is absolutely no ways that a non-seaman uh, person would be able to know and be able to write this kind of detail unless that person was actually a eyewitness. Um, actually writing of the actual accounts of it. So it's an incredible, uh, for me, always encouragement um, on the details of God and, and how much he um, loves us by putting these things in. It's, it's, we, we know the truth and, um, and the truth sets us free and no one can challenge it. Uh, so maybe I should uh, start off by just saying um, we kick off uh, in an another section of what I call the we sections in Acts, which means uh, Luke is writing as we, um, which again is, is um, meaning that he was present and, uh, and with Paul all the way along this particular narrative and journey. Uh, basically, the whole of chapter 27 going into 28, it's about the middle of 28, uh, around verse 15 or 16, um, you get the, the, the fourth and last we narrative. The other we narratives uh, where Luke is writing as we did this and we did that uh, is in chapter 16, chapter 20, and chapter 21, um, which we've looked at. But uh, it is an interesting one. And as we shared a little bit when we first uh, started with the book of Acts, um, I think Luke is a fascinating, um, good study, uh, of, and also a person who just is an incredible man. And, uh, and to think that he um, undertook this journey with Paul is, is also just, it blows me away. I know he was Paul's physician, but um, it's still another just incredible act of, of humility in, in, in undertaking uh, this very dangerous journey with Paul. So um, what I'll try and do is um, when I was studying this, um, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me in terms of the, the heart and, uh, and for us a journeying in our walk with the Lord uh, that I want to um, just share. But let's just unpack the, the story a little bit and, and pull out a few little uh, truths there. But it's, it's, um, it's a very self-explanatory uh, re read. Um, if you also um, would like to at any stage look at Paul's journeys on a map and then study that map and, and then study this last journey of Paul's on his way to, to Rome. You'll get an idea of, of how this fits. Otherwise, it's just dropping off ports 
and places that they stopped over, but you, you don't get a good feel or an understanding unless you're actually looking at the journey and the picture. And, and it would be too long for me to explain. And it, it really needs a map where you can have a look as you're reading this it will be very helpful in this situation. I also just want to say this, that in our day and age, um, you know, travel is, you know, you plan and you book and, and things come on time and um, they're very uh, organized and run like clockwork. Well, the reality is uh, in, in Paul's day, um, that was nothing like that. So it was very hard to, to plan in terms of travel, when you were going to reach where and what was going to happen. It depended on circumstances, situations, the weather, etc. And so now we're talking about a ship and a journey by sea. And the ships by sea were um, could take ages. You know, it could be a short journey. It totally depended on situation and the weather. So um, just so you bear that in mind as he begins to go on this journey. It's not like he just jumped on a ship and was heading off across uh, to another place, you know, a port on the other side kind of thing. Uh, the, this this was a, a quite a dangerous and, and, and perilous sort of journey that he was undertaking. Okay, so 27, we know we've ended at 20, 26, uh, where um, we've had, he's been, um, King Agrippa has had a little, little listen to what he's got to say. Uh, Festus has promised him now he's going to go to Rome. So it starts off in, in chapter 27. And when it was decided, obviously Festus decided that we should sail for Italy. They delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustine cohort named Julius. Um, I could go into all the details there, Augustine uh, or Augustine a cohort, uh, but history will tell you that they, a part of that, of them were stationed uh, at Caesarea. Um, so it, it again also validates what he's saying. Um, and also in those particular days, uh, they were um, allocated um, guard duty over prisoners who were traveling by ship. Um, so it wasn't uncommon for uh, um, a group of, of soldiers to accompany uh, prisoners. Um, so, and we don't know much about um, this guy, Julius, but um, he seems like a fair and a good man in the story. Um, and embarking in a ship from uh, Grootwoord, um, Adria Martium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia. We put to sea accompanied um, by Aristarchus, uh, Macedonian from Thessalonica. Um, I love that. Again, also you can go and study a little bit about him. Uh, he seemed also to be uh, one of the traveling companions of Paul. Uh, seemed like literally laid his life down like a servant to Paul, um, a friend, as Paul would call him. You can read about him in Colossians. Um, he was one of the group um, of, from the Thessalonians that came to bring their gift uh, with Paul to Jerusalem. Um, so you can read about, about him uh, in the more uh, and hi the history behind him. But he's also with Paul on this journey. So Paul's got Luke. And he's also got Aristarchus. Um, so the next day we put uh, in at Sidon. So Sidon is just up the coast. Um, Sidon is, uh, Paul's already visited there a couple of times. So Paul would have been ministering there. He would have um, known an, a number of um, the Christians in that port. And it says, Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. So beautiful moment. Obviously, in those days with the ships, they stopped in at the ports and then they had to offload cargo and and load cargo, which took quite a while, um, certainly a number of days. And um, so they, the, the um, centurion has given Paul the kindness of being able to go uh, to see his friends. Um, remember that Paul is not uh, guilty yet. He hasn't been charged, so he's on his way. So he is a Roman that is that is not uh, is not guilty yet. So the centurion is obviously being very lenient. Also, we know and understand that um, Paul was not like the other prisoners that were accompanying him. Um, a lot of those prisoners were already on death 
rows, you would call it, they were going on their way to Rome to be fed to the lions, etc. So, um, but Paul is in a different bracket here. So he's given the liberty and the freedom. Um, he's got some of his friends accompanying him, Luke and Aristarchus. And he's, um, he's also now gone to the church. So he's able to encourage and strengthen the church over this little while. It's just an amazing picture, beautiful picture here, time to just spend uh, with the church. Um, gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. Um, I love the Bible. His friends is such a, a powerful word. If you do a little study there, um, even as Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Um, it, it's throughout the word of God, you'll see that this language develops. Uh, even in uh, John, uh, you see when John writes, I think three John, um, I think towards the end of it, you know, it's greeting to um, his friends the, the Christians were, were actually seen as, as, as brothers, as friends, and the language was that's how they were referred to one another, friends. Um, so uh, that's a good study to do in the Bible as well. But he, when it says he goes to his friends, it's not just means his chummies. It's all the people that are born again um, that are in that region that he goes to go minister to. Um, and then uh, when they're now ready, they finished their loading up and what have you at the port at Sidon. They put out to sea from there. We sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. So immediately they leave. Uh, the voyage now becomes difficult. Um, and, it's, and it's now tough sailing. And they're not really getting um, the kind of speed and uh, where they want to go. Um, it's, it's kind of the winds are against them. When we sailed across the open sea uh, along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Maria in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship um, of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. So what happened is these ships, they, they kind of were trips. They went from port to port. Um, it, was a, um, it was a guess when they would arrive but they had their routes that they were going on. So he took this trip, as, uh, this ship as far as he could take it, but then it was going to carry on um, across the Asian Sea. So he, um, he has to find another ship that's going to, to Italy. And uh, it says here that he found a ship of Alexandria. Um, in a nutshell, obviously a ship that came from Egypt. Uh, let me quickly give you the background there. Egypt was like the bread basket of the Roman Empire. It's where all the, the, the grain, the wheat came from. Uh, it was a very important uh, supply route. Um, they used to have these grain cargo ships that used to travel from um, Alexandria, from Egypt, uh, coming to Italy all the time to provide food because obviously um, they had a, 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 a huge population uh, in, the, in the Italy, in, in Rome and, and surrounding areas that uh, needed food. And um, uh, history will tell you that they had a few little altercations that happened with the uh, emperors, particularly Claudius, um, when he was pelted uh, with all kinds of things because uh, they ran out of, of grain, of wheat. So. Um, it was quite uh, strategic that that uh, these these trips were done and they were they were monitored um, and uh, they had soldiers always uh, on them to guard the grain and uh, Claudius himself actually um, guaranteed um, the insured really the grain that that they would get paid for the grain and he also guaranteed if they lost their ship or anything happened to it he would they would also be covered so it was quite a lucrative trade for for um for grain so um it was very easy and possible that um the roman soldier obviously had found one of these ships that was traveling uh with grain and uh, that they could hitch a ride on and uh and and do their voyage. They were quite decent ships. Um, I think about 36 foot wide and 140 foot long kind of big ships with one big main sail. They operated with two paddles at the back, not as not with one rudder, but as two kind of paddles at the back to steer these ships, but they weren't very good. 
uh, sailing into the wind, um, which becomes a problem in this particular situation. Um, that's just a um, piece of useless information. Um, here the Centurion found a ship from Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty. Uh, Sinaitis. I'm going to need my glasses. Where are they? Oh. Am I reading it right? Let's have a look. Uh, yeah. And arrived with difficulty off Sinaitis. And as the wind did not allow us to go further, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmon, coasting along it with difficulty. We came to a place called Fair Havens, near, near which was the city of Lycia. So you can see uh, it's tough, tough days, um, tough sailing. They're not getting anywhere fast. Um, and uh, time has gone by. And again, why is this important and why is he sharing this with us? Let me quickly just say that um, Festus had arrived and taken over his responsibilities probably somewhere in early spring of AD 59. He's now um, listened to Paul's case and now sent Paul off, which is probably um, in uh, early autumn. So well before the storm season. Um, and to give you an idea, the storm season was... Um, it, it, it kind of uh, started to get bad to sail from about the 14th of September onwards, but certainly from the uh, about the 10th or 11th of November, it was impossible to sail and they shut down all sailing for the winter. So um, 14th of September would have been a dangerous sailing. And now it's, he, he started this voyage a little early, but now he's getting into the storm season. So stuff is beginning to happen here um, on his journey. Uh, and then he came to a place called Fair Havens. Let me just say this. Um, it's a bit of a, um, what would you even call it? It's a bit of a, a misdemeanor that it's called Fair Havens. Um, because it might have been a great port in summer, but it was a terrible port in winter. And history will show you that it was very open and exposed to the winter uh, storms and winds. So to actually shelter there as a ship, was probably not a great idea, um, but probably better than sailing. Um, um, so, I don't, you know, again, I think it was probably the people that lived there that called it Fair Havens. Um, uh, I think nobody else would have called it Fair Havens. They would have called it Nightmare Ridge or something. But um, anyway, I am baffling, waffling. What am I? Waffling. Um, I'm baffling, waffling, waffling. Um, so, verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. So actually here, uh, Luke is, is defining things and putting the time things in. The fast was already over. The fast, obviously the Day of Atonement. Um, the Day of Atonement, uh, you'd have to go look according to the, the history and the new moon and what have you, Jewish feasts and traditions. Um but that would have probably been somewhere around uh, the 5th of October um, in AD 59. And so it is now, that's gone past. So it's past that. It's probably around about the middle of October. So we are well into um, stormy season here. This is not good for, for travel. Um, so Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Um, there's nothing to say here that this is a prophetic word from Paul. Um, I just want to encourage us to, you can go read in 2 Corinthians 11. Um, you can read about all the things that happened to Paul. And uh, so up to this point, he's actually spent a lot of time on ships. He's been shipwrecked three times. So I think he's a fairly knowledgeable person in terms of um, on ships and how they function. And, uh, and so he is actually probably just saying, look, I'm perceiving this is, this is not good. This is not good, guys. This is not a good time to be sailing. And uh, my encouragement is maybe we should just, uh, you know, stay here and, uh, and just settle in. Uh, it's, we're not going to make Italy uh, before winter. And let's just, let's hang in here and, uh, we'll, and, and let's, you know, everyone will be fine. And let's do this voyage a little bit later. 
Um, that's what I believe. Um, some um, commentators, um, you know, believe Paul, uh, this was a bit prophetic by Paul, but there's no indication of that. I just think he was just advising them, saying, sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss. I'm, I'm trying to, from my personal experience and ships and all the kinds of stuff that I know, uh, this is not good. Um, and he said, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So again, I don't think it's prophetic because we later get a prophetic word which says that nobody's lives will be lost. So Paul is just saying, yeah, look, I'm worried the ship's going to get damaged um, and potentially some of us could lose our lives. Okay. Verse 11, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. That's practical. does make sense. Um, the owner of the ship and also the guy who actually is sailing the ship would obviously be very knowledgeable um, and they would have the most to lose. So you would think they wouldn't risk and they would be risk averse. Um, but because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix. Now, Phoenix was the main port. Uh, it's a harbor of Crete. It was the main harbor, much more safer, much more secure, much more established. So a great idea if sailing was good. Um, you know, instead of this little harbor, uh, Fair Havens, um you could you would rather want to go to phoenix i understand that um and they would want to sp uh, spend the winter there the other thing there which commentators will give you on this one is fair havens was a really small port not much going on there so a lot of the time when these ships with their crews um, stopped off at a harbor and then stayed there over winter they did uh, try and make sure that they selected a decent place um that had um, some um, decent drinking holes and places to eat and what have you, and to enjoy, uh, you know, a, a, a few months of, of a good time. Um, so Fairhaven was obviously not a great attraction. There was nothing to do there. It was really small versus Phoenix, which was a bigger uh, port with uh, lots of action activities and sailors would have loved to have rather stayed there. So there was also some practical reasoning and uh, and 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 thinking behind this this decision, um, that just man's wisdom and man's thinking and natural thinking and natural uh, tendency and and uh, for man's uh, enjoyment pleasure a lot of uh, things coming into this decision right. Then verse thirteen. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose. They weighed anchor and set and and sailed along Crete close to the shore. Now, this is actually a very important little statement here. Now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing they had obtained their purpose. And this is what a lot of Christians do uh, when they're making decisions in their lives and wanting to do things in their lives. They go with circumstantial evidence or circumstantial things. So, hey, it all looks good. Everything kind of seems to be lining up now. I think it's right. I think we should go do this. Um, instead of just listening to the word of the Lord, instead of honoring the word of the Lord, we often uh, get swayed um, by the circumstances, by our, our reasoning, our thinking, man's wisdom, man's intellect, and um and so it seems, supposing that they obtained their purpose. So they discussed and they said, listen, if the wind can die down and it gets to the, the conditions are right, then we can head out here and we can, we can, we can do this thing. Um, and uh, so it's, again, also just a lovely illustration for every single one of us as we seek the face of the Lord, as we seek to know his will, just be very careful that we don't base it on circumstances, situations, or things that just line up and seem to be favorable. Um, rather listen to the Lord and go and what, what God is saying than um, what your situation may be speaking or saying to you. Okay. Um, so they set sail now. Conditions are favorable. Perfect. Yes, it's time. We are going on this journey. Yes, I believe it's God. We're going to go on this journey now. But soon, the minute they took off, it wasn't very long and soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. It's uh, Euros Aquilo, 
Uh, it's uh, the Greek word euros, which is east wind. Aquilo, which means north wind. So it's quite a funny thing in Greek. East wind, north wind. So basically put it together, the northeaster wind. It was a howling wind uh, known in that region to be absolutely horrific for sailing and cause many a, a shipwreck. So um, this wind now is, is coming over the island of Crete and pumping at crazy um, speeds. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. So what it means now is that they actually don't really have control of the, of the ship. It's just being pushed along by the wind. So it's not going where it needs to go. It's now going a little bit off course. And the ship was caught and we gave it into it and it was driven along, running under the lee of a small island called Corda. We managed with difficulty to secure uh, the ship's boat. Uh, in those days, you know, um, their lifeboat, their rescue boat, they used to um, tie it and it used to be pulled along behind uh, their ships. Um, and in very bad weather, obviously, often this snapped or the, it came loose and it drifted and disappeared or it used to, with the rough seas, get smashed against the boat and get broken up. Um, so what they often used to do is haul it in, lift it up and, and tie it down on the, on the ship. Um, so they secured the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Uh, oh, then, and then after hoisting it up, they used supports uh, to undergird the ship. In those days, too, they had supports or ropes that they used to uh, put underneath the, the boat and tie them so it, could, it would used to hold the boat together in difficult seas. Just uh, another precaution against the ship breaking up uh, with the, against the pounding of the waves. Um, after hoisting up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sartus, um, the Sartus, you can call that the um, Bermuda Triangle of the day, um, which uh, was a very uh, horrific, dangerous area where, when the winds used to blow, there was a lot of all the ships ended up there and being shipwrecked. Uh, so, they lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. Uh, since we were violently storm tossed, they began. The next day to jettison the cargo. The practice in those days of the ships was they tried to release some of the cargo to lighten the, the load um, of the ship um, just to help it in very dangerous seas. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So now when they say that, often now they start throwing off all the, all the other uh, equipment and stuff on the ship. That was kind of a last resort of... of of uh, trying to make the ship uh, as light as possible and as buoyant as possible. So this is rough seas, waves are crashing uh, into the boat and, and, and it's, it's obviously uh, filling up. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. So this is incredible. Um, here's Luke, he's writing and he's writing this. He's saying, when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days. So how did they um, know where they were going and get direction in those days? It was from the, the sun and from the stars. So because now storms and clouds and whatever, they can't get their direction anymore. Um, so they don't even know where they are, where they're drifting. They, don't, they could be drifting into rocks. They could be drifting into hitting an island or land or, or anything like that. They completely... And it's been days and days and days and days and and they don't know now this kind of they they're actually saying they lost all hope of being saved saved um and so all hope was abandoned they abandoned any hope of living now this was they were finished right since they had been without food for a long time um paul stood up among them and said men you should have listened to me <laughs> i love this um, I don't want to say this is what Paul was saying, but it's the closest thing you can find, I guess, to I told you so uh, in the Bible. Um, but it's like Paul's going, you should have listened to me. I told you so. Um, but in a nice way, in a very biblical, correct way, he was just telling them, I told you so. Um, and he was uh, not just saying that, but he just went a little bit further and also uh, he now urged them to take heart. 
Um, so he didn't just say, I told you so, you guys are crazy idiots. He, he also went on to say, but take heart, don't worry. Um, there's some good news. I've got some good news for you as well. So, um, and then we're going to go into that now. But let me just also touch on this. Since they had been without food for a long time, food, they've been without food, food for a long time. Um, can I also just say that on those trips, this wasn't um, the Queen Mary and waiters were coming along serving you tea and and food and all of that and some lovely um, um, cucumber sandwiches. This was uh, on these particular ships, you had to go to the galley yourself to get the food. Um, so obviously with all the sh stuff going on, well, number one, you must have been pretty seasick. Uh, so you didn't feel like eating. And number two, it wasn't exactly the most easiest thing to get to the galley to, to, to fetch food. And in this kind of tumultuous sea, you might have found that the galley was closed as well. There was no food being served. So these guys hadn't eaten also for a long time. So Paul was addressing uh, that. Um, but he also now says, listen, you should have listened to me, but take heart, uh, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Um, for this very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. I love that. Quite a good and wonderful encouragement and a statement for every single one of us as believers. Um, it's not just that, um, you know, he's just talking about God in some kind of abstract way. This is God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. See, when you know whose you are, when you know who you are, you know whose you are and you know who you are, then you can speak with confidence and with boldness in any situation that you and I have to face. No matter what storm we might come our way, if you know whose you are and who you are. Um, and he said, do not be afraid, Paul. So this angel comes and says to him, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all that those who sail with you uh, and those who sail with you. So he's just saying, listen, you're all going to get saved here. Um, so don't worry. No stress. Take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. Okay. Um, again, not sure if the full details uh, of what the angel said to Paul has been um, disclosed here, whether the angel did tell him a little bit more like you're going to be run aground. Because um, it's interesting kind of to know how Paul can make the statement that they're going to run aground on some island. Um, it could have broken up in the middle of the sea due to the storm, but it seems like he knows very specifically of what's actually going to happen. Um, so not sure of the, of the details um, there, but um, the Bible doesn't give it to us. So we just um, assume that Paul is speaking directly from a, a word from, from this angel. Um, then verse 27, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding. What they did then is they had these, these like uh, lengths of rope with a big weight and had markings on it. They used to drop it down to see how deep um, it went. And then it would tell you how deep you were. And if you kept doing that, um, you could tell if you're coming towards land because obviously it got shallower the closer you came to land. So that was kind of a way if you didn't really know uh, with the sun and the stars and where you were and you couldn't see anything. And there was one way they could tell how deep and where they were uh, traveling. So they took a sounding and found 20 th fathoms. It's about 120 feet. A little further, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. It's about 90 feet. So somewhere between, I don't know, 30 30 and 40 meters and something between 20, 20, 25 meters. Um, uh, so it's getting, it's getting shallower. Um, and fearing that they might run on uh, ground on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. So what they did is they dropped all the anchors down and just prayed that they would kind of hold the ship and it wouldn't be dragged any closer to, to um, rocks or to an island where they could get smashed up. And just pray that day would come so they could be able to see. Um, and as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, 
and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of, of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. So basically, the sailors now, um, they're, if they're fearful, they think that um, there might be a chance the ship gets smashed, but they're obviously getting close to land. So that they pretend that they, they're going to do something at the back of the ship and maybe, um, you know, uh, tighten up some of the ropes and what have you. But meantime, they want to actually let, lower the, the lifeboat down the back of the ship and, and, and sail off and get away, you know, and try and get their own plan of rescue to the island. And, uh, and Paul finds out about this plan somehow. And he goes to the centurion and tells him about the plan. And um, it, it's, it seems like the centurion now is wanting to believe Paul and believe what he was saying. So um, he decides that, uh, no, these guys can't leave. Um, and so they cut the boat away. So they, 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 they lost now the lifeboat. So now they really are uh, in the hands of the word of the Lord. Um, as it's spoken over that particular um, ship. Um, and uh, um, and when he had said these things, uh, oh, therefore I urge you to take some food. So now he said, um, uh, no, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As, day was about, as the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've continued in suspense without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from uh, the head of any of you. That was a saying in those days. They would say that you no, nothing, no harm is going to come to you. It's beautiful sayings. You can find it in Luke 21, Matthew 10. Um, always when Jesus talked about not a hair on your head will be harmed, it was about your life, that God would protect your life. So Paul saying this, God's going to protect them. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Again, lovely language. Every single one of us as Christians would kind of go, this language lends itself to communion. Seems like it's the language of communion. So potentially Paul might have been saying that and the Christians that you were speaking to understood what he was saying um, and that um, that could get, draw strength um, from partaking of communion. Um, I do think that we don't want to go down this road too deep. I think he was also talking about, you know, uh, food and that the guys needed to be nourished and to eat the food because it doesn't go on. He didn't say, you know, he took the bread, uh, the cup and there was wine and, and what have you. It just, I just think the wording here does lend itself that there was some symbolism here uh, for, for the Christians to take heart uh, in terms of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that uh, Jesus would protect them and, 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 and save them. So you can read in there and study a little bit in there, um, definitely um, symbolic here of communion. Um, and then it says, we were in all 276 persons in the ship. That's amazing. So decent sized ship, 276 people on the ship. And uh, when they had eaten enough, I love that they, they uh, took heart and, and, and listened to Paul. When they had eaten, then they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Um, there's not much given for the reason here, other than potentially when they threw out the other parts of the cargo, this might have been part of the cargo that they couldn't get to at that time. And now things have got very dangerous and they decided to now throw everything overboard. The other thing is obviously also greed and money may have made the owners keep some of the hoping, keeping some of the cargo, hoping they could still somehow, you know, um, save it and get some money for it. But now their lives are really at stake. And when your life is completely at stake, it's amazing how everything else becomes uh, of little value and um, and just saving yourself becomes the highest priority. Man's greatest uh, default is to protect himself at all costs. So um, here, yeah, even the money of of the 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 wheat now is getting tossed overboard. So that's also a sign that these guys were in deep deep danger. Um, now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land. So it's daytime; they don't even recognize where they are. They don't recognize the land. Um, but they did notice a bay with a beach in which they planned if possible to run the ship ashore 
so they look and they see this bay. They see there's a nice beach there. So they're looking going, I don't know where this place is. I don't recognize it. But if we can somehow steer the ship, we can run the ship up onto the shore there and then, you know, it'll all be saved and everything will be, be fine. Um, so they cast off the anchors. They don't think they need the anchors anymore. It's another sign that this is in desperation here. Yeah? Just toss the anchors because that's weight um, into the sea. At the same time, loosening the ropes, they tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. So now they're just trying to just uh, raise the sail and let the wind just drive them onto the beach. Um, but they didn't realize um, that before you get to the beach, you have to cross over a little reef. And, uh, and they struck the reef. Uh, and the, the, the vessel is run aground. In other words, it, it gets stuck on the reef. And now it can't move. And uh, obviously, the front is stuck and the back is getting buffeted by the waves. So it's just a matter of time before this ship breaks up. Um, the bow st stuck and remained immovable and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. We've seen this picture before. In those days, um, the Roman soldiers, they were given custody over prisoners. If the prisoners escaped, the same sentence that the prisoners were going to get comes on the, the person protecting them, the soldier that's looking after them. So they were, they were a bit terrified here because um, these, a lot of these guys were sentenced to death. And so if they escaped, then the soldiers would have been killed. So they thought rather than that, they'd rather kill them now. Um, so the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. Um, but the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. Another beautiful example of the will of God, the protection of God, the plan of God, um, that even now when the soldiers are wanting to kill Paul, uh, supernaturally God uses the centurion, Julius, to thwart the plan and to stop it and to protect Paul. It's just uh, beautiful. It's amazing. The, the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. So God says that the ship's going to be lost, but no life will be lost. And God's uh, word comes to pass. And uh, it's a beautiful, um, again, picture of um, the word of the Lord. Uh, always coming to pass. Um, it reminds me of Job. Um, and, you know, he says, though, Job, I think it's 13, 15, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Um, it's almost like you just put your confidence in your faith and your trust uh, in Jesus. He always is faithful. Um, and when you look back, you can always see um, how he, he was leading and how he was taking care of everything. So that's uh, chapter 27. Um, there's so much detail in there. Um, you can have a free for all. I mean, I loved James Smith, how the guy spent many years of his life actually studying this journey and actually studying the shipwreck uh, of Paul. Um, so, you know, um, my encouragement is knock yourself out. Uh, go for it if you want to find out more about uh, Paul, the shipwreck and all those kind of details. It's a fascinating chapter of incredible description and detail, uh, I, like no other for me in the Bible. So it's just like, wow, um, the depth of the reasoning behind it that God, the Holy Spirit, wanted uh, Luke to write this. Again, um, honestly, not sure, um, but it's just a beautiful analogy. And um, let me say this, uh, the, the truth that I took out of this, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I'm all right. The truth that I took out of this is I want to encourage every single one of us that we get to places in our lives where we're encountering storms. And this is a story about encountering a storm, the worst storm that, that you could ever face, the worst storm that Paul could ever face. Let me say this up front. Um, sometimes um, God is with us and leading us through storms. Other times the enemy brings storms. But we will face storms. Storms will come. There is uh, no avoiding that storms will come our way. And so now it's how do you face a storm? Um, what happens in a situation when um, all the fair havens 
in your life are in the distance and, 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 and nowhere near for you to be able to run to. And uh, often in these times when we face these things, it seems like everything else that we can grab hold of, everything else that we might have confidence in, everything that we might uh, want to lean on or, 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 or try and, and grasp gets stripped away. It's almost as if in these storms, in these times, we're left with a reliance and, 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 a, and a total um, uh, leaning and a dependence on God. And I think, uh, I often think that is the journey and the purpose um, in, in these storms more than anything else. It's, it's, it's the growing, it's, it's, it's more than doing something for God. It's, it's, it's God doing something in us. And I think sometimes as Christians, we lose sight of that reality of we, we're so gung-ho that we're doing something for God, that he needs to just quickly sort out the storm uh, so that we can get and do what he's called us to do. Um, but often in that, there's no transformation of heart. And God is always in the journey. He's always in building and establishing who we are inside. Uh, the storm should not shake us because our confidence and our and everything is, should be put in Jesus. Connor was sharing on Sunday a little bit about, about Jesus in the boat. Disciples going absolutely nuts looking around them. The waves are crashing. Uh, the boat's starting to get filled up with water. Jesus is having an incredible sleep um, uh, with a nice pillow in the, in the boat. No worries at all because he had such confidence in his father and who he was and in whose he was. And uh, he was just uh, totally at peace and at rest in the storm um, because he wasn't looking and grabbing hold of things. Often our distress is because we, we're looking to things. We're looking to the natural, to things that uh, other things that might have worked in the past, things that our wisdom, whatever it is, uh, often those things are, are, are stripped away uh, in our journey, in our storm. Uh, and we, um, we're left with a confidence and a trust only in God. And, uh, and, and often that's what he's looking for. He's looking for you to look to him and rest and lean on him and have a total confidence in him. Either he is God and he is Savior and he is Lord or he's not. Please, let's not pretend. Um, as Christians, often we pretend that we have this confidence and trust in God. And let's not pretend if, if it's not our reality. Um, and, uh, and sometimes storms help us see whether that is our reality or, or not. And, uh, and so, and they're just there. They're not there for God just going, going yeah, yeah, and pick on us. It's there to see, um, uh, you know, and to work on the things if, if they're not there in, in our hearts. And, uh, and let me say this, I'll say this. Part of this picture is that there's a storm. It's a horrific storm. And when it's a horrific storm and there's nothing else that's available except the word of the Lord and, and God, um, it is easy to reach out and to grab hold of the promise of God or the word of the Lord when there's you've got there's nothing else to grab hold of um, the challenge in the story and the challenge with a lot of Christians is that they have a faith and a confidence when there's no other hope and they just grab hold of God but the minute some other hope or some other thing comes in they often let go of God's promises and reach for that isn't it interesting that they, they were, yes, yes, God, in this particular story, but then suddenly when there was another plan or some another way practically where this could work, these guys decided to go and wanted to go for that. And um, it's a challenge to every single one of us. Often when we, when we don't have any other options, we cry out to the Lord and we just, we, we just grab hold of him and say, Lord, I put all my faith and my trust and my confidence in you. And then as we're journeying along this thing, holding on to him, when there comes another option, uh, we suddenly go, oh, no, maybe I should. And we want to grab hold of, of that option. Let me just say, not, not a good or a wise thing. It is better to be in a sinking ship, holding on to the promises of God, than to get into a lifeboat with the potential of, of, of you know, being rescued out of, out of the, the, the plan or the purpose of God. And uh, in our situations, often, when we face with storms in our lives, we often want to grab hold of God. Speak to me. We want to grab hold of a new word. So, Lord, 
just tell me something, um, you know, give me something new. Give me something that I can hold on to now. My encouragement to you is that God didn't give Paul a new word. He just reinforced an old word. If you remember before that, God said he was going to take him to, to Rome. He just reinforced what he had already spoken to him. Can I encourage you that God has spoken in his word? He's, there are many wonderful promises in the word of God. And he often in these situations, it's not that you now need some new word. God, please, God needs to speak to me. You need to go back to the word of God and go back to his words that he has spoken and grab hold of those words because he is faithful and true and that which he has spoken, he will bring to pass. Amen. So I wrote a couple of words down just to encourage you if you, if you have pens and paper or you want to just uh, remember this. Um, I love these words like Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. These are powerful promises. If you can grab hold of these, you can go through any storm, anything that you're facing. Uh, you can trust him. He is uh, true. He is faithful. And he will see you um, to the other side. John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Beautiful promise. Philippians 4, 19. You should know this one. My God will supply every need of mine according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 8, he will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the in the storms, in the shipwrecks, in the in the um um starless, what's just no sun and no stars completely, uh, all the things that maybe you used to use to help you in your directions and and uh, using your man-made wisdom or your or your experience or whatever to to help you and guide you in what direction you went. Um, when all those are gone, um, he's standing there, uh, and you can trust him. And he's just waiting for you to invite him uh, to be that person in your life, which is to be Lord, to be King, to be the one that you totally rest in rely on, uh, lean into, uh, and trust with all of your heart and all of your life. So again, you can take out of this analogy um, the beautiful uh, uh, journey of Paul in the storm. Um, and if you face situations and circumstances, can I encourage you with what I've just shared? Um, don't, don't get distracted. Don't um, look for other things. Um, just look to him, rest in him. You can actually sleep. That's how confident you can be in God. You can sleep in the storm. Um, you can rest in the storm and trust him. He is faithful to see you through to the end. Amen. I have landed. <laughs>